Video game open worlds are becoming increasingly popular in the modern age. Gone are the days of epic linear experiences told through a cinematic perspective, instead these have been replaced with large worlds filled with content and stuff to do. Every other game is peddling some kind of open world, regardless of the genre or setting. Video games sometimes have their entire marketing campaign backed on the size of their open worlds. Games like No Man's Sky's sole purpose in life was its large open world, or universe as it were. Today we're going to be taking a look at the open worlds in five games of varying sizes and genres. Batman Arkham Asylum, Grand Theft Auto V, The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, The Crew, and No Man's Sky. As you can see, each game we're going to be discussing increases in size, so we'll take a look at these games' open worlds and discuss what the perfect size is. I've tried to pick a nice variety so we can really get down to what makes these open world games great or not so great and determine how big is too big. Batman Arkham Asylum was released at a time when open world games were on the rise. The market wasn't exactly saturated with them yet, but games like Mass Effect, Fallout 3 and Grand Theft Auto 4 were getting open world games right and they were being praised for it and selling amazingly well. However, a genre that wasn't exactly the most successful of all time were superhero video games. An abundance of movie tie-ins and clunky game mechanics had seemingly doomed that market forever. It was the Batman Arkham franchise that revitalised superhero games and proved they could be just as successful, if not more, than regular video games. Batman Arkham Asylum took heavy influence from the comic books and truly was what could only be described as the definitive Batman experience. But this video is about the open world. What was the open world in that game? Well, it, it was minuscule. The game is set entirely within Arkham Asylum, so that severely limited the number of places you could actually have in the game. But they did something unique with that game's open world. You see, most video games have these huge open worlds, and maybe 5-10% to of that game's map is actually relevant to the main campaign, or the player who is just trying to speedrun themselves through the game. The game was this winding twist of corridors with eerie secrets hidden behind every corner, Riddler challenges that made the game feel like you were truly stuck in this asylum, solving puzzles and the like. On top of this, having the game structured in a cinematic way allowed you to feel part of the asylum and its story. Arkham Asylum was a game that really did suit the small open world. If it had a big open world, I feel like it would have ruined the story of the game slightly and made it feel more video gamey. However, there's only so much content you can get in a small open world. I feel as though this sort of complaint was answered in the form of Arkham City and Arkham Knight, but that means there clearly was an issue here. Arkham Asylum mainly had a small open world because of the limited budget the team were working on and the technological limitations of the time, which definitely explains the later games. Now, Rocksteady did the best they could with that open world. They built the game's aesthetic around what they could do and they truly made it work with the way the map was laid out. They had proven that small open worlds definitely could work if a developer went about it in the right way. However, and as they most likely realised with later games, it's much easier to make a good game with a larger open world. With Grand Theft Auto V, Rockstar have tried to reimagine the open world game in a number of ways. Let's kick things up a sizable notch fin and take a look at the open world of Grand Theft Auto V. Now, in my opinion, GTA V's open world is nowhere near as large as many people make it out to be, but that doesn't change the fact that it is a large open world. Rockstar, in fact, are considered pioneers of the open world. Grand Theft Auto III in 2001 was the first of open worlds as we know them today, and the success of that game and the games that followed it is why we are where we are. So it can only be expected that Rockstar would make an amazing open world with their headline game, right? Yeah, you're right, and to be honest, with their open world, they delivered in almost every possible way. 
The amount of content in Grand Theft Auto V is downright incredible. Not only does it boast a fair, chunky story, it also features dozens of Strangers and Freaks side missions, shooting ranges, street races, sports like golf and tennis, trafficking missions, parachuting, flight courses, collectibles and random events scattered across the map. I read once about the 40 second rule of open world video games, that to make a perfect open world game, when exploring the map players should see some open world content that interests them every 40 seconds. And GTA 5 gets that right excellently in most of the map. The streets of Los Santos and Sandy Shores are littered with content to do, but there's a whole lot of map there that isn't Los Santos or Sandy Shores. That's where I think the open world of Grand Theft Auto V has been neglected significantly. You see, it's not enough just to have content in specific areas of the map, especially when you're making a single player game. It needs to be spread across evenly, or at least semi-evenly. You can't just have huge spouts of content in one area of the map and have nothing but dry mountains and wilderness everywhere else. Not only this, but for me, the side content in the game felt severely detached to the open world, and whenever you went to do any of it, you felt sort of locked in, so it didn't add to the open world as much as dynamic events could have, and while dynamic events are technically in the game, they are minuscule and nowhere near scrape the level of detail of content you can see in other parts of the game. People who know me will know that The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt is my favourite game of all time. Everything from the characters, secondary systems, RPG mechanics, combat, side missions, and yes, open world. Unlike the other games on this list, instead of having one large open world, the open world is divided into five different instances, with regions like Velen slash Novigrad, Skellige, and Toussaint possibly being just as large as many other games' entire open worlds. The Witcher 3 takes a very different approach to the open world of each region. Velen is a land of ugly swamps and forgotten villages, Novigrad is a bustling city brimming with corruption and intrigue, Skellige is a cultured land of fishing villages and majestic creatures of the sea, and Toussaint is bright and colourful, a land of blood and wine. Not only are these areas of the map very different visually, but they also differ hugely tonally too. Remember the 40 second rule I told you about before? Well, CD Projekt Red are the leading pioneers of that rule, as seen with The Witcher 3 and their upcoming game Cyberpunk 2077, which by the way looks amazing. You basically have two approaches to traversing this game's open world. You can either follow the roads, which will grant you the occasional side quest or Witcher contract, or you can traverse through the mountains, fields and forests, and you'll discover a plethora of content for your own enjoyment. Bandit camps, hidden treasure, a monster lair, maybe even a mysterious dead body with a journal next to it with a dying monster. The open world of The Witcher 3 feels lived in like a place that exists when you aren't playing the game, a place that existed before you played the game, and a place that will exist long after you complete the game. Not only this, it accomplishes that while also being a very large world, and the amount of content doesn't discriminate based on where you are in the world. However, it does set the correct tone based on where exactly you are. I need to stop sucking this game off, because if I carry on much longer, I'll end up just stopping making this video and just stop playing the game myself. Fuck. Alright, so what are the issues of the open world in The Witcher 3? W well... Uh, fuck. G give me a moment. I am trying to think. Okay, alright, so you've got this issue that a lot of the content in the game is shown on the map, so you kind of lack that sense of discovery that you might experience in a game like Skyrim, for instance, and you may sometimes see textures reused to populate the open world, but that's to be expected. No game is perfect, but that doesn't change the fact that the open world in The Witch Every Wild Hunt is a modern marvel. The Crew was announced in 2013 and its entire marketing campaign was based on its open world. 
At the time, the open world racing game was an increasingly popular trend with games like Forza Horizon taking their places as some of the best racing games on the market. And whenever there's an industry trend, Ubisoft are going to fucking capitalise it, aren't they? Because... Fucking Ubisoft. It, it, it's probably worth noting that I enjoy the crew and the crew team more than the average person. I'm only going to be talking about the crew as a whole here though since the maps are virtually identical in both games. I think even if executed poorly, the simple concept of being able to drive around the entire United States is enough to sustain a game and make it passable regardless. But what actually fills this large open world that Ubisoft have created? Well, it's a racing game, so it goes without saying that a lot of the stuff you're going to be doing is heavily centred around racing. Astute observation, you fucking retard. Shut the fuck up. I'm trying to figure out how to word this. Fucking cunt. Basically, you're going to want to go from A to B a lot when you're playing this game, and the map is crazy fucking big, like, stupidly big. So they fill up the world with these little fun side activities, just interesting little objectives and challenges to keep you entertained on those country roads to take me home West Virginia. And I mean, it, it's set in the USA, so you're going to have different environments, so regardless, driving from coast to coast in this game is an insanely fun experience, and it's a great way to wind down when you're bored. As someone who doesn't usually play racing games, the open world is probably the main reason I even bought the game. But as I said, something can be amazing in concept and poor in execution. In fact, we'll see another perfect example of this with our next game. It doesn't matter how much effort you put into the game, you can't make a game this big and expect it to have the same level of detail you experience in the three games I just described. It's a sacrifice, and while yes, there are detailed parts of the world, like the interesting landmarks you're obviously going to see, the vast majority is very samey looking countryside and small towns, and a lot of the side content is seemingly randomly generated. Who knows, one day we might get a game as large as the crew with enough content to justify that, but that day won't be for a while, for technical reasons, if nothing else. Ah, No Man's Sky. In a video about games map sizes, how could we not mention No Man's Sky? No Man's Sky is easily the biggest game ever made, and it is actually several times larger than our observable universe, which, in all honesty, is pretty fucking crazy. Going back to what I said before though, about some things being amazing in concept and terrible in execution, No Man's Sky is a shining example of that. I've done a video about this before, but the simple concept of hopping into a spaceship and being able to shoot through an infinite universe, it's not a possibility that can't at least excite something within you. An ambitious game, and unlike the other games on this list, it is all procedurally generated, meaning very little of the content is made by an actual person, rather a computer algorithm. But what type of planets are there in No Man's Sky? How varied are they? Well, I'm going to be completely honest here, I think planet variety has definitely dropped recently in No Man's Sky, and is less alien-like. However, the game used to be stunning in its planet variety, and it's still alright now I suppose, but I think there's an overabundance of water, desert, and snow planets. The game doesn't rely much on its open world, moreover, it gives you tools to play around in, and an infinite universe, and lets you go nuts. And that, I suppose, is a different approach to any of the other games on this list, and it's more common in games like Minecraft or Gmod, but I feel as though this wasn't the initial goal for No Man's Sky. At its core, it's an exploration game, but what is there to explore? For the most part, it's just empty planets with barely any civilization. Sure, seeing the occasional animal or outpost could give you a short burst of fun, but that burst of fun doesn't really last long. The world of No Man's Sky is empty, and unlike the crew, I can't see a single possible future where a game world on this scale could even have 1% of the depth you see in Arkham Asylum, Grand Theft Auto V, and The Witcher 3. Whereas I think a game the size of the crew and the depth of The Witcher is a very real possibility in 5 to 10 years. No Man's Sky will always be a shallow experience, and you can't emotionally connect to shallow experiences. 
it's fun, sure, but there's a huge difference between what's fun and what's great. So, let's remind ourselves what we can do with a small open world. A small open world allows for a more refined focus. Small open worlds can be cinematic experiences, and I believe that in the future we will have small open world games on the cinematic scale of something like Uncharted or Naughty Dog. Jesus Christ, I'm doing a lot of predicting today. What am I, a fucking prophet? In all seriousness though, small open worlds, I keep saying less and less, which is a shame, because you can put a lot of detail into something of that size. It's puddle-sized oceans and ocean-sized puddles, and small open worlds are puddle-sized oceans. Let's discuss the middle of the road open worlds for a moment then here. This here is probably my favourite way to do it. Have a decently large sized open world and fill it with large chunks of content. Luckily, this seems to be the way most game developers are doing it nowadays. However, the quality and depth of the content varies from game to game. Not only is this my personal favourite method, it's probably also the most successful, with Grand Theft Auto V and The Witcher 3 being considered some of the greatest video games of our time. This way, you set aside both those who are yearning for a fair-sized open world, and you also satisfy those who want a manner of depth in their content. It's true that some games get this better than others, but it's a fine art, and if you can get the medium-sized open world right, and you can get the actual gameplay mechanics right, you could end up with a perfect video game. Or as close as you can get. And then you've got the large open worlds. I described both of the large open worlds, The Crew and No Man's Sky, on my list as amazing ideas in concept, but poor in execution. And that truly is the thing with large open worlds. At the moment, they're not so much video games as they are glorified tech demos, a proof of concept. And like I say, one day maps as large as The Crew, handcrafted ones, could eventually be just as good or better than The Witcher 3, or Skyrim or Red Dead Redemption, but that's not going to happen this console generation, and personally I am of a belief that it will never ever happen with procedurally generated video games. An open world in a video game is an art, not a science. The open worlds for each of the respective video games that I've mentioned happen to be the perfect fit for the type of game they are. I don't think for a moment that if you upscaled Arkham Asylum to be Witcher 3 size, or downscaled No Man's Sky to be Witcher 3 size, either of them would be as good as they actually are. But it's what you can do with the depth, and how you allocate resources. It's really quantity versus quality, the age-old debate of getting that perfect balance. No game map will ever be too big, as long as it has the content to justify it. And at the moment, that size cap lies somewhere between The Witcher 3 and The Crew. But rest assured, with the advancements of technology and hardware, with each passing day, that size cap continues to increase. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I did try to put a bit more effort into this video in making it a bit longer than usual to test it a bit and see how it goes. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I do believe this is the first time I've mentioned The Witcher 3 in one of my videos. So I feel it's important to know that I'm going to be pedaling away at a large, maybe one hour long Witcher 3 retrospective at some point in the background of making all my other videos. I don't know when it will be ready, it could be next month, it could be next year. We'll just have to wait and see because I'm committed to making that video the best that I possibly can. If you haven't already, please be sure to hit that like button, it really does help me out and let me know in the comments what you thought of the video, if you like this new length, and what size open worlds you like. Be sure to subscribe, share this video with your friends, my Instagram, Snapchat and Twitter links are all in the description. Once again, thanks for watching, have a great day, and I'll see you guys in the next video.